did his studies in Germany because also he actually has a strong German background. And he was actually in Karlsruhe. And then he did the, the PhD in Grenoble, working with uranium platinum three, and it's a multi-phase uh, heavy fermion system. And about heavy fermions is what he's going to speak today. Then actually, after the the, the doctor uh, Arbeit <laughs> in uh, in uh, Grenoble, he moved to Madrid, also for Marie Curie, then Ramon y Cajal, or the the different steps. And now there, he's a professor since uh, 1990, exactly. And well, as I said, he's uh, leading a big group in Madrid, taking care of all of these uh, ultra low temperature type of uh, measurement, but also taking a lot of responsibilities in, in different services in Madrid, like the, the huge liquid factor that they have there, which is providing liquid helium for the whole community and hospitals and so in Madrid. It's quite a nice, something very appreciated now, right? And also the uh, Sun Foundation there, you have the Nicolas Cabrera Foundation. Mm -hmm. So it's actually quite active also in promoting all these transversal uh, activities in the department. So we are looking forward to your talk. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. So th thank you very much, Nacho. And uh, thank you so much for allowing me to come here and to discuss with you. It's always a pleasure to come to San Sebastian because there is lots of physics, not, not just also uh, nice, nice uh, things uh, outside, but uh, it's, it's really a pleasure to be here. And thank you so much for the opportunity. And uh, well, actually, as uh, Nacho said, if you you know there are ocho apellidos vascos, no? So I don't know my eight ones, but <laughs> but if you continue, there is Herman Jesus Sudero Rodriguez, which is not very fast either. But at some point, just after Rodriguez, there is Urrutia from Amurrio. So there is <laughs> some local connection. And uh, so I'm very happy to be to be here. And uh, uh, okay, so I'm going to tell you something about scanning tunnel microscopy, which I think doesn't really need an introduction in such a place here, but uh, I will try to make my best to, to introduce it to you. And the main objective of the, of the talk is to speak about quantum materials and uh, what we have been trying to do in this uh, during, during the last uh, time. <laughs> So before I start, let me um, uh, say a few things uh, because otherwise I will I will forget it. And uh, the first thing is uh, the very important thing. So the collaboration which has been uh, uh, about this work. So of course there is uh, Alfredo, uh, there is Isabel who are both at our university and they are very they have been very important collaborators in in this. There are the group of Grenoble which uh, they provide us with samples and a lot of nice ideas and also Paul in Ames. And uh, there are also our Colombian uh, colleagues who have been having a, a large, uh, uh, say, uh, uh, protagonism in, in the last uh, work. Uh, but I would like to especially acknowledge uh, Peter Openair, who has been showing us a lot of the things which can be done using, using calculations, and in particular Edwin. So some of you know Edwin very well, and uh, Edwin has been behind uh, the whole thing which I will, which I will show you. And then another thing which I would like to talk about before forgetting is that in 2025, we are going to organize uh, uh, you and, uh, and the whole low temperature Spanish community is invited to organize uh, uh, the low temperature physics conference uh, LT30. So uh, you may ask why Bilbao and not San Sebastian. I think that, <laughs> of course, you agree that in August, it's probably more convenient to bring people to Bilbao and not as expensive than to bring to San Sebastian. And uh, of course, uh, San Sebastian was, uh, was the first option about uh, Madrid, uh, but Madrid is hot and, uh, and also expensive. So I think that this is probably a very nice uh, solution. So the LT conference will happen at the same time as the International Year of Quantum Science and Technology, which is going to be decided I mean, it has been decided by UNESCO, and at some point it will be decided further to become more, more, more known about it. So it's a very nice year to do things about quantum technologies. And uh, I think it's a great opportunity that we have this possibility. And I hope uh, for the participation of as, as much as possible of, uh, of you. So, and, uh, so the LT conference has a very long history, as you see here. And I think it's very good that we, we can organize this for the first time in the southern part. Okay, so uh, of course there is this uh, thematics and uh, uh, I think that uh, this being said, we can start with uh, physics. And, uh, and uh, I'm going to make an introduction first about what I'm going to tell you about, particularly about heavy fermion, then make a little bit of publicity, if you allow me, about the things which we have in the laboratory, and in particular, uh, say something about uh, this material. 
If I have time, I will continue to speak about Johnson spectroscopy, but if not, I think we can we can leave it there. Please I'll be, be free, feel free to, I don't know what is the use here, but uh, if you want, feel free to stop me and ask uh, questions. Okay. So first, let me go on. Of course, uh, when you speak about STM, I think everyone more or less starts here with Feynman. With uh, he, he showed that, that you can build the uh, atomic lattices and so on. I think this is known here. And the one who realized this dream was Binnig and Rohrer with the invention of the scanning tunnel microscope. Now, if you continue reading Feynman, you read this paragraph, which is about low temperatures. And uh, he said that he, he had some envy about Kamerlingones because Kamerlingones had a monopoly at some time. And he started with these low temperatures phenomena. And the low temperatures also led to the discovery of superconductivity in mercury, and probably also to the, to the, to the idea that quantum materials are materials which can lead to amazing applications and also amazing physics in particular. So one of the big questions, I mean, of course, there are lots of applications. For example, superconductivity, you can have these nice cables with a relatively high critical temperature, and they are used in all hospitals and in trains and so on. But actually, there is one big question. It is what is the origin of this, of this phenomenon at high temperatures, and in particular, what is the role of electron correlations in this? So electron correlations are the ones which are responsible for the high critical temperature superconductivity, and we don't know how to, how to describe them and uh, how to manipulate them in some sense. So this kind of phase diagram gives us some, some clue. So we have a superconductor, and then we have strange electronic excitations, which change as a function of some uh, tuning parameter. So <clears throat> this is very nice, but these materials are relatively complex. And there are, there are, there are uh, some uh, 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 part of quantum materials, which, are, uh, which I would like to focus in the rest of the talk, which are F-electron materials. Mm -hmm. So you have seen that uh, 2025 will be the quantum year of, of uh, 2019, it was the year of the periodic table. So uh, at, some point, at this point, so the chemists, a group of chemists, they, they gave the periodic table to their, you know, their relatives, the mother, the father, and they looked on where their eyes look and they saw that the, the ice, sorry, here, they go into the transition metals. But of course, they think that the chemistry of the rare earths is uh, much more important. And so they propose to flip the, the periodic table so that the eyes of the people go closer to the rare earths. So this uh, small exercise, uh, uh, well, it just uh, tells you that uh, it's interesting to take a look on this part of the periodic table. And the two elements which I would like to focus are these two here, uranium and cerium. And why these two elements? We can see this if we take a look a little bit more on, on physics. And uh, we have the, these are the wave functions, how the localized they are. And uh, you have the transition metal, they are more or less spread it. Uh, 5F electron, they are a little bit more spread it. And in the case of a 4F, they are pretty much localized. Now, when you increase the nuclear charge, so actually you shrink this, and, uh, and uh, it happens that the whole, that the, that the F electrons become localized, and therefore you get magnetism. But you, if you are here, you are on the brink of magnetism and something else. So it is something where you can very easily tune it and uh, obtain different kinds of ground states, and therefore also study the uh, uh, electron uh, interactions. So here you have electron interactions within the F shell, and also electron interactions with the rest of the uh, system, which contains eventually D electrons and so on. So this uh, apparently complex mm -hmm. uh, uh, situation gives a nice playground to make uh, nice things. And uh, these are the things which I would like to focus uh, about. So usually when you start speaking about F electron states, it is nice to speak to start with this system here. So Ethereum is uh, actually a unique uh, material, as far you may correct me, but as far as I know, it is completely unique. So you know that uh, uh, we have the phase diagram of water, and you know that we have a critical point. We have a point above in pressure temperature where we can make no difference between the liquid and the gas. And there is no critical point in a solid, that's what we tell students, because usually when you have a transition in a solid, you have phase transition, a structural phase transition, and therefore you can always differentiate and you have no no such a situation. Serum is the only known solid where you do have such a situation. And the reason is that between here and here, you have a volume change by more than 15%, but the structure does not change by anything. So the structure of this phase and of this phase is exactly the same. And therefore, when you can define this critical point. So what is happening there? So of course, uh, what happens are electron correlations with the, with the F electrons. 
So you switch over to a situation at high temperatures where the F-electrons are localized and you have a spin to a situation where part of the electrons go over, part of the localized F-electrons go over to the, to the free electron bath and therefore uh, here hybridize with the D-electrons. And therefore you lose the uh, magnetism here at low temperatures and you have a bit of more uh, hybridization. So we can speak about what we could call intermediate valence. We have here a full valence, which gives you a magnetic state. And here we have a partial a valence of the F, which gives you a non-magnetic state and the hybridized states. Now, there are different ways of explaining uh, this, this thing. One is to consider a kind of mod correlations within the F-shell, and the other one is to consider the conduct screening between the F-shell and the rest of the electrons. So this is still under debate. Even in this simple material, we still don't know how it works. <laughs> so it's open for calculations. Of course, now people, as you can see here, uh, it's, it's a nice playground for people who do calculations because it's relatively simple. So, but when you have this serum in another, in another uh, surrounded with uh, D or uh, P electrons, so then you can have these kind of situations. You have eventually a heavy band, which is because of the of the of the P of the F electrons, and then some light bands, and they hybridize eventually at low temperatures, be, um, giving something mixed up. And this is what we call heavy fermions. Now, this can be um, pushed uh, quite quite uh, far. And they actually, in the tunneling, when you do tunneling, you actually tunnel partially into something which is heavy and partially into something which is light. And therefore, you get a kind of interference pattern, which is called the Fano anomaly. <clears throat> and when you take a look on the band structure, so for example, here the F band structure, you can actually reproduce quite well what is being obtained in the experiments, particularly here close to the Fermi level. And when you consider the uh, electron weight outside the Fermi level, you see that there is lots of weight a, a, a close to it, but a the finite uh, energy. So these things can be described more or less, and of course the question is how to describe this more precisely. But there is one simplifying uh, situation which comes about this experiment. I think this experiment is, has been made at high magnetic fields. So this is uh, the, the measurement of the uh, Fermi surface. And this experiment shows you that in this material, which is a material which has F-electrons because of the uranium, you uh, can actually, from this, you can you can actually obtain the, the, the geometry of the, of the Fermi surface. And uh, the geometry of the Fermi surface is actually exactly, uh, uh, I mean, is, is, has been measured in full. Okay, so there are all bands which are contained within these measurements. Mm -hmm. Now, you may make uh, calculations and you may calculate the, the effective mass, for example, here, and you may compare with what you find here. And actually, even if the geometry which you get is correct, the effective mass is absolutely completely wrong by uh, two orders of magnitude. So uh, essentially with this, you can, you can have a nice picture which you can do to work, which is okay, I have a system with a very strong electron correlations, but when I go to low temperatures, to low enough temperatures, I have practically the same as in a free electron gas, but I have to renormalize the mass. And this happens very nicely. So you can have really a family liquid into some uh, situations. So, and uh, it's, it's just for, for those of you who know, you not, don't only have a renormalized family mass, but also have a Wilson ratio, which is close to one. So you can even kill the magnetism with the Wilson ratio is related to the magnetism. <clears throat> now, of course, you also have a lot of a lot of entropy. And there is one game which is important in this, but I won't go into very much detail, but let me just mention it is that if you have uh, F electrons localized in each place, you have to consider the exchange uh, between uh, F electrons. And you, there is a competition between the exchange, which gives you anti-ferromagnetism or ferromagnetism through the electron path, or the condo screening. And this competition is actually very heavily uh, uh, dominating what happens in the physics of this material through this phase diagram, which is called the, the Donia diagram. And essentially, because of you have, it's actually related to having such high effective masses, you actually maintain a lot of entropy when you go to low temperature. And this means a lot of electronic entropy when you go to low temperature. And this means that the green Eisen parameter, which tells you the susceptibility of, uh, of an electron system to changes in the volume is huge. And because it's huge, these systems are highly tunable. And you can actually, by changing magnetic field, uh, uh, some tuning or some tuning parameter like pressure, you can actually um, have lots of nice phases. So it's not that you, that you get a nice Fermi liquid at low temperatures, you actually change this and you can obtain something uh, different. So these are very nice materials to study that. And uh, of course, many of them get superconducting. So I will speak about this one. 
this one is probably the only practically, I mean, together with uranium platinum three, the only superconductor where we are certain that this uh, chiral superconductor. And uh, well, you can see that using atomic uh, 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 STM, you can, you can uh, measure that. Mm -hmm. So there are lots of cases. In a few of them, you get these nice surfaces, and we are going to focus on this one. So <clears throat> just let me briefly remind you that, well, we are going to see STM experiments, and uh, I don't think that I have to put that, uh, to explain that much here, but with an STM, you essentially measure the local density of states, and uh, you actually measure empty states and the uh, field states. So uh, usually macroscopic measurements like the one I have shown, you just measure the Fermi surface, and with an STM you measure above and below, so you can get access to more things. Now, how do we operate our, our microscopes? So that will be a little bit of publicity, but uh, well, you, may, you may stop me. And, uh, and uh, uh, so, uh, well, I have been checking on, the, on your webpage, and I have seen that there is this nice initiative. And uh, actually, when I came to Madrid, so, we we had uh, we bought for five million pesetas a uh, fridge, which is this one, and these components are exactly the same that are hidden uh, somewhere here. Uh, so uh, I would never have thought that this famous guy would make a photo of himself in front of uh, Dilfridge. <laughs> so I guess that this is what the revolution of what is going uh, on now, right? So uh, you will get uh, is one, one of these fridges uh, soon with all the uh, additions for, uh, for doing quantum computation, of course. But maybe it's good to remember that uh, the reason why it works is because of these two persons, so particularly uh, Heinz and Fritz London. Fritz London, you know, from the equations, London equations for superconductivity. Heinz London is not so well known, but he discovered actually this uh, phase diagram, which is actually beautiful. So in the same way that you have F electrons and uh, actually uh, when you when you when the LF electrons are localized actually you have a Fermi temperature which is high when you start delocalizing the F electrons you actually start populating with heavy electrons the rest of the path in some sense so you decrease the Fermi temperature and therefore you you get uh, you get high effective masses and the same happens here here you have pure here you have pure F helium three which has a relatively high Fermi temperature so it's uh, to one point, it's uh, around 1.8 Kelvin. So when you remove helium-3, the Fermi temperature changes and decreases. So the working principle of this uh, machine is very simple. So you just have to, uh, because here you have a Fermi gas, and if you place yourself here, here you will have the degenerate Fermi gas. So the, the Fermi function will be something like that. If you place yourself here, the Fermi function will be very much spread out. So if you manage to get atoms from here to here, you will force them in a high entropy state. And because they go into a high entropy state, they have to uh, get the energy somewhere and they cool. So it's a refrigerator, and this is the operating principle of every refrigerator, but here it's a different one because you use the, the, the properties of a traffic gas, that's all. So thanks to this, uh, you can cool down to low temperatures to operate the qubits and the uh, and there. So we now have uh, five operating dilution refrigerators in Madrid, and uh, we try to do the best out of them. So <clears throat> our, our SDMs, they are like that. So we have been working to make them as small as possible. And you see that we can obtain the atomic lattice. This one is actually 3D printed nicely. It's not that it makes a big difference, but it looks nice. And, then, <laughs> and anyhow, it's very small, which is the most important, right? So one thing which may be important is that there is a, there is a difference with respect to a UHV system is that uh, we have everything goes must go in situ. So everything must be cooled and everything must go in situ. So the tip is here, the sample is here. So how do we prepare tip and sample and make sure that it works? So, <clears throat> well, first of all, just we, we build our electronics ourselves. This is very important to, to get also the high energy resolution. And uh, you can see that we can, we can observe uh, atomic lattice. And uh, we also have lots of filters. So the STM is located here inside the magnet, and therefore there is little manipulation to be done here. So everything has to be mounted outside, and if you want to prepare the surface, you have to do it inside there. So it, it works. So here you can see tunneling spectroscopy curves in aluminum, here in lead, and from this we can extract the energy resolution, which is of this order. So we, we have, of course, uh, powder filters and things to, to get down to there. So <clears throat> the way we prepare our samples is like that. So we glue something on top, 
It has to be a single crystal, of course, a nice single crystal. And then uh, we move in situ the sample holder, and then this uh, makes a mechanical action on the post, and then the post flies, and then you go back, and then you approach it. Now here you see another 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 sample. So this this sample here is uh, of the same uh, material as the tip, and eventually you can uh, by doing atomic manipulations you can clean the tip and have a nice uh, pyramidal shape. So using this we can obtain this. Recently there has been uh, Isabel. She has been developing the high magnetic field uh, activity. So she has discovered two-dimensional superconductivity in calcium, in potassium, iron, two arsenic, two zinc vortices at 20 Tesla. This image is here. I made a 20 Tesla, which is a huge magnetic field, and uh, done a lot of things with, 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 uh, with these machines. Uh, we are also trying to see if, thanks to this, we can rotate the, 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 the STM. We will see if we manage to do that or, or not. And we are measuring many different systems. So this is a type 2 by semi-metal. And uh, it has a uh, bile cone, and uh, it also shows Landau oscillations. So uh, in a, you get uh, you have a parabolic, but you apply magnetic field, you get quantization because of the uh, circular motion of the atoms, and this quantization gives you these peaks, and you can follow them and relate this to the to the properties of the bile nodes. And uh, this is a very nice system. It's a magnetic bile semi-metal, and uh, here we have been seeing chains of. Uh, uh, Thin, where we see that there are there are edge states, very nice edge states. This one becomes uh, semiconducting at the surface, and you have quantum states at the, at the located at a few positions. This is also a bile semi-metal, but magnetic one. And uh, of, we also have a, 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 an activity to grow uh, materials and to synthesize materials. So this one you know very well here. It's the bismuth to palladium. It's a superconductor, and uh, we also try to die to do other kinds of, of materials thanks to the help of uh, Paul Canfield, particularly. And uh, with this, so we have been measuring the, the ten tunneling density of states of many materials. So here I show you different superconductors. This is a two gap superconductor. These materials we have grown them and measured them in the lab, and we have obtained also the superconducting density of states. So <clears throat> we also work uh, because we have uh, this nice uh, liquefier. So there is a, there are very few places where you can have on a large scale a, a cryogenic. Uh, and now there is a very big activity in Airbus to try to, to, to get down to 20 Kelvin because every airplane in 20 years will have a cryostat, uh, which with operates at 20 Kelvin. And that's the only way out for them to, to get uh, uh, aviation uh, in, a, in a green way. So, so there is no other, other possibility. So instead of having the kerosene in the, in the, in the wings, they want to do hydrogen at 20 Kelvin here on the rear part of the of the airplane and we are trying to help them reasonably enough with this with this okay so this is more or less uh, the, the, the thing for, for the for the for the for, for the publicity in some sense and let me <laughs> let me start over for our results in in real ruthenium to silicon so <clears throat> actually I think that every one of you knows that well you have the block stage in the solid then you come to the surface and uh, then it's a surface inside the gap in the dispersion relation, you eventually find a surface state, which is a nice thing because it's a two-dimensional system. Now, uh, uh, you can may do this in copper. You can get a lot of electrons in copper, but there are places where the Bragg scattering open gaps, and there you can find such a nice uh, surface state, which you can follow and seen by the ripples which have been seen in in, in, the, in using, using STM. So you can follow as a function of the energy and you see that this, this wavelength changes because of the K vector changes. So that's kind of nice. And uh, of course, when you have these two dimensional electron gas, you can put barriers. And when you put barriers, then you have an energy quantization. And the energy quantization goes a few hundred milli electron volts here. And you can build these nice uh, systems, which has been studied for, uh, for a long time. Now, the question which we want to address is, OK, we have these heavy bands here. We have the, co the, the, the concept that these heavy bands form a heavy family liquid. So the question is, uh, with heavy family liquid, heavy effective masses. So the question is, can we create also two-dimensional electron gas out of this heavy family liquid? And uh, this is the question which we wanted to address. And the difference, the main difference is that here you are speaking about electron volts. And then the hypothesis is that here we are going to speak about milli electron volts. And as I'm going to show you, it uh, works. Briefly, let me show you uh, the work which has been done in heavy fermions close to the surface. 
This is a beautiful work by, by Denise, which you probably know very well. And, uh, and uh, there are, of course, other work in two-dimensional heterostructures and also in a, in a semiconductor. And they all more or less show that there, is some, there are some correlations on the surface, but they don't really show up a, 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 a two-dimensional heavy electron band mass. So here they find something which is very important is that the valence changes when you, when you go up to the surface. This idea has been followed here. Probably this is the one who really got closer to it. So they actually made the heterostructure and in the interface, they, they put the two-dimensional electron gas and they show a mass renormalization of a factor of three. So, <clears throat> and here, this is lateral quantization and the corresponding mass is relatively high. So here you can see it's also in the range of electron. So we set up on this problem and we started, then we started on uranium root and M2 silicon. I will speak about more, the, more about this material uh, later. Just let me show you that, well, it's a heavy fermion, okay? And then it enters here a peculiar transition. We are going to work here at low temperatures inside this transition, but I'm going to show um, this transition a little bit later. Mm -hmm. So it's a very peculiar transition because it's a, it, is, it, it carries a huge entropy, but no one knows what is ordering, okay? So of course, some electrons, some electron property is ordering, but no one knows what it is. It is not magnetism, and, uh, and that's essentially what we know about. And uh, we know something in spite of, of, the, of the, this, this was uh, long ago. And uh, in spite of that, we of course know many things about the symmetry, many things about the excitations, but what actually is ordering there, we don't know. So this material is the one we studied, we studied for this. And uh, essentially because you have a nice uh, surface, and uh, let me just for the completeness, I show you also a, a photo emission results. So of course there are photo emission on the surface and uh, you get something which is close to a heavy, Fermi surf a heavy surface state at some directions. So this was possibly the closest who was uh, obtained uh, before our, our work. So we do our STM experiments where we have reproduced what other people have been uh, measuring. I'm not going to present details, but essentially this is a fan anomaly. This is the gap related to this kind of strange order. And here you have the superconducting gap. Mm -hmm. So it works. And uh, now let us go on what happens in the, in the surface. Mm -hmm. So we have been focusing on these surfaces where there are lots of terraces. Mm -hmm. And the terraces are relatively small. And when you take a look on the conductance here on a color scale, when you, this, when you go through different terraces, you see that the conductance changes a lot. So when you do scans like that and you plot the curves, you see a lot of nice peaks, you know, a lot of small peaks here. And everything is blurred. The superconducting properties are kind of blurred inside these peaks. And uh, it is quite difficult to understand, right? There is some anomaly which is here and some anomaly which is also here. So in an energy range, which is absolutely ridiculous, so just below one million electron volt, there are lots of physics happening there. So uh, it was quite difficult to try to understand that, but uh, uh, Edwin got hot into that and he, he managed to get some understanding. And the way he, he did is actually, mm, mm, it's actually given in this figure here. So here you see that very faintly, there are kinds of maxima in the tunneling conductance. And if you count them, you may think that here there are four, five, six, seven, eight, with a little bit of imagination. And uh, then you, of course, have to take, deal with, with, with uh, the properties of the, of the surface. And in these properties, there are also anomalies which are located here. And there is one anomaly which is located here and another one here. Mm -hmm. So this is an edge state. I will uh, go to this later. And these are probably uh, uh, changes in the band structure in the bulk. So once you remove them, then you can make a comparison with a fabri perot uh, uh, analysis. And uh, you can see that you have this quantization which uh, works uh, nicely as a function of the energy. Now, when, when, you, when you count these numbers, you can obtain the wave vector and you can obtain the energy. And with this, you can obtain the band dispersion and calculate the mass. And the mass is mm, 17 times the free electron mass. Excuse me, I got lost. What is the distance of what is that? That's it. That is the distance along this axis. Sorry. Okay. Along this axis. And these are curves which are averaged over, over this. <coughs> over this um, uh, over this direction, so so it's actually difficult to get this. It's in on a on a on a on a on a very very strong background, mm -hmm. and so you see that the, the 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 levels are kind of quantized, and you see that they increase with energy. So we did not catch the bottom of the band, which is hidden here, and uh, well something something else happens there, 
and uh, and uh, that's that's where we got it. But essentially, the important thing is that this this effective mass is actually very high. <clears throat> And uh, you can also actually make uh, make scans of the of the conductance, and you can see that you can follow this quantization quite nicely and uh, fit using a, a Fabry-Pedrot arrangement. You can also ask yourself what is the reflection coefficient because, of course, there is some reflection here on the borders of the of the of the of the of the, of the terrace, and uh, you can trace the reflection as a function of the of the energy. This is what you would get for copper, for example, and this is what you get for a heavy fermion like this. So it's something which, which works nicely. You can also make a, a scan here on the middle and see how the conductance changes with the bias voltage and see that it corresponds to what you expect for, uh, for the reflection coefficient, which we have been showing in the previous transparency. So these things work pretty nicely. And what is probably more important is that you can actually extract the lifetime of these states. And curiously enough, the lifetime of these states, even if being heavy fermions or because they are heavy fermions, it's, it's, it has been renormalized to relatively uh, um, relatively high lifetimes. So <clears throat> actually, you can you can fit this using and try to fit this using a two-dimensional electron gas, but you have to put interactions, and then you get something which is more or less like the energy squared, and uh, that works out. So from this, you can also extract the mean free path, and you get something which is more or less compatible to the to the bulk uh, mean free path. So where do these states lie? And there are friends of theory uh, uh, came up and uh, this is the band structure. You see it is, there is a lot of bands here and there is one place here which I would like to focus. So I will come back to this, these two differences a little bit later. And uh, uh, so in this place, there is, if you make the calculation with the slab and so on, then you find that there, is, uh, some, uh, there are F electron states located here. And the F electron states have a dispersion which is similar to the one which we observe, despite some, some small uh, shift here. So there, is, there are surface electrons there, and the surface electrons are kind of kind of uh, nice. How much time do I have this? We still have like 15 minutes. Okay, great, thank you. So <clears throat> uh, uh, now let me show what happens here or maybe on the on the borders, right? So you see here that there is there is a kind of deviation of these of these uh, tunneling conductance. Mm -hmm. So when you take a look closely, actually there is something which uh, may, let us take a look here. Here, this is the border of a terrace. You see that the gap opens here, and this is I think you you may know about this from surface physics. When you have a two-dimensional electron gas and you get into a step, then you open a gap there quite often, and uh, and inside the gap you may have one electronic state, which is a one-dimensional state in this case. Mm -hmm. So uh, this uh, can be can be modeled through uh, through um, through a quantum well. And uh, then you see that there is a high electronic density of states whenever you are in this uh, localized state. So here you see there is a high conductance in this energy range because here there is a one dimensional edge. Now, what is very peculiar here is that uh, this is a, a system which has four fold symmetry. Now, uh, here, this has not four fold symmetry. So this is located here and here, but not here. So uh, this is something which is very puzzling indeed. Because uh, if the electronic structure is four-fold symmetric, it should be also four-fold symmetric. Now, of course, this may be related to this uh, hidden order. Now, <clears throat> the hidden order is actually we, we know many things about hidden order. We don't know wh what the, what orders, but we know many things about it. And one thing which we know is that this is a tetragonal structure. Okay, and then when you when you go below this transition. Actually, uh, the two uranium sites, which are inside the tetragonal structure, one located to the corners and one at the center, uh, they start to be non-equivalent. Now, the structure, the electronic stru uh, crystalline structure, it remains exactly the same. There is no uh, structural transition. But electronically, there is a gap which opens and which makes that the Fermi surface is nearly kind of split into two parts, uh, which, uh, but it does not lead to a structural transition. So this can be reproduced with, by, by theory by taking a look into account on the, 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 the spin states and how they generate they are at the normal phase at high temperatures and in the ordered phase at low temperatures. So this tells you that, of course, the, set le the F levels have some role in this phenomenon. And you have go from the usual Brian zone of the tetragonal zone, so the tetragonal structure to another one, which is the simple uh, uh, tetragonal and Brian zone. So <clears throat> this is something which we know, 
And, uh, but of course, there is a four-fold symmetry. Now, there has been quite some debate because there were some people who, uh, uh, this one here, who said that, okay, maybe there is a two-fold symmetry inside the hidden orders, but the difference, it was very, very tiny. And later they showed that this two-fold symmetry is due to impurities. So there is still four-fold symmetry inside the hidden order. So our suspicion is that inside in the bulk, there is still four-fold symmetry, but for some reason, maybe for valence changes close to the surface or whatever happens, there is a two-fold symmetry appearing close to the surface. So in some sense, these states, they also help us to uh, understand better how correlations work in this, in this material. So you can, of course, this is the usual symmetries which you find in a, in a tetragonal system. And here you have uh, actually very similar symmetries, but you see that the two Eulerian planes are not uh, uh, equal. So we can say something about the symmetry using this using this measurement. And then there is something about the, the, the superconducting gap, which may be a little bit, uh, this system then becomes superconducting and we are measuring inside the superconducting phase. So um, people think it's a chiral superconductor. So people have lots of uh, different stories for this, which is uh, very nice. Now there is one story which, which, uh, which has been for an experimentalist uh, very puzzling. And it is that when you measure with the tunneling spectroscopy, you always see these kind of faint features. For here, for example, here, this, this is in serum cobalt in 5, and this one, which is another uh, F-electron-based superconductor, and this is on uranium-tellurium-2, which is this nice chiral superconductor where you have these kind of small features here, which is, okay, why not? But uh, it's not something easy to explain, particularly when you take a look on the specific heat. So the specific heat really tells you if the system goes superconducting because it tells you how much excitations the bulk has. And what the specific heat tells you is that at zero temperature, there are zero excitations. So the gap is fully open. And this is absolutely incompatible with the curves, which are, I showed you previously, it would be rather compatible with curves. Uh, uh, oh, I didn't, don't have it here, sorry. But with curves, which I have shown you in the beginning, where you have a high density of states and zero states inside the gap. So the way to understand this, we believe, is that we have to understand these this, this, uh, curves at the surface through a connection through these two-dimensional electrons. So we have to take into account that there are anomalies close to the energies of the superconducting state, which actually have a very strong influence in the tunneling conductance curves. And when taking this into account, we have a good model where we can fit our data and we can understand the um, changes as a function of the, of the temperature and follow the superconducting gap. So there is a very strong influence of these two-dimensional states in what happens in the SDM at low temperatures. What is the model that you're using? This is a model where we are coupling, actually, we have a superconductor, which is proximity coupled to the two-dimensional electron. But this, as you know, is not enough because it will give you a mini gap. <laughs> and then what you have to do is you have to, to make a partial coupling to a Lorentzian, and the Lorentzian is broad and set, okay? This is this is how it works. Okay, okay. and uh, and uh, and uh, this gives you actually this kind of curve. So this Lorentzian here actually enters into. into. But uh, this the justification is now clear because you have a two-dimensional electron, which is coupled to the resonances which are there. So 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 there is there is there is no zero density states. You suppress the proximity effect. You suppress the proximity effect, but you suppress the full uh, the full density of states of the bulk. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So this is what we can say uh, uh, in this state. In particular, I think most interesting is that we can now play with surface nanostructures to see uh, if, what if we can understand about uh, correlations. So uh, maybe I can show you how much time do I have? Five minutes? Maybe? You have, uh, I want to see this data. <laughs> you have, uh, like I said, eight minutes. Okay, thank you. Because this thing, you know, it, it starts thinking that you are running or something. So you lost, <laughs> you lost the track. Okay. So, okay. So I wanted to, because, you know, uh, so uh, we, we, we work a lot on superconductivity. So we have been figuring out something relatively new. And uh, I thought that it may be good to show it. To you, so this is the work which has been made by with Samuel and with Alfredo, whom some of you know very well. So uh, now, of course, we have this nice hand, and uh, we don't want to get, get graphs just of the density of states. We also want to see Cooper pairs. And now, to see Cooper pairs, you need a superconducting tip, 
And then you need to take a look on a tiny feature, which is located here. This is the current, this is the voltage. And if you look closely, there is a small peak. And the reason why is the small peak is that you are through the barrier, there are Kupa pairs who tunnel. Okay. And this Kupa pair tunneling, you may trace as a function of the position. So here you have the vortex lattice when you apply a magnetic field. Inside the vortex, there is no Kupa pair tunneling. Outside, there is nice Kupa pair tunneling. So something which you can follow as a function of the position, and then you can get access of the Kupa pairs, which is something useful. Now, people have been doing these kind of experiments for a long time. So, uh, 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 but essentially, you always get these curves here. Mm -hmm. And there is a very strong interaction with the photon field, as usual, when you, are, when you have a, a superconductor. And uh, there are some features which are explained by this interaction with the, with the photon field. And uh, uh, essentially, you get a conductance which is pretty, pretty small and which is within a gap which is open. So within a region of current where there is nothing, just at zero bias, you get a, a finite conductance. And there are people who have been so, for example, very recently, Katarina showed that you may, get, uh, you may make a sort of a diode using this kind of, of effects by using Shiva impurities. There are people who have been taking a look on the pair density wave. The concept of a pair density wave is a very nice concept. It is if you have a superconductor, and then you assume that the, 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 there is some order parameter which changes sign as a function of the position. It's not clear what is the other parameter either, but uh, it, it is there. And it is, it is thought to be very important to understand the high temperature superconductivity. So you can trace this situation as a, you can trace this as a function of the position by making maps of the of the of the Josephson current and by seeing how the Cooper pairs interact between the superconducting tip and the superconducting sample. Of course, there is theory about that. This is very nice. Because actually, you he, they propose you may even even find uh, even detect fractional excitations, and uh, the idea is that in that case one would lose the sinus phi uh, relation between between which governs the the the, 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 the which tells you something what is the relation between the difference in phase between both electrodes and the current, uh, but this may change because of many things. Of course, so it's a little. Uh, it's maybe a little too far-fetched, but of course there is lots of uh, things which can be made concretely, and uh, that's the end. Hopefully, one day this too, uh, but uh, uh, and you can follow this nice peak as a function of the position, which is very nice. Now, this nice peak has one problem: it is too small. I will show you later why. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually, there was one measurement which by Marcus Termes in his period PhD, where they show this shoulder here. Mm -hmm. Okay. So <clears throat> we have been setting out with our experiments here. And just to make the point here, there are no states. And when you measure with the superconducting tip like here, you have to make a very strong zoom inside here. Mm -hmm. Now you may take a theory, okay? And ask what, uh, ask Sebastian, what you one should get, right? So then if you ask uh, uh, Sebastiano Alfredo, they tell you, okay, what you should get is here, you have zero current, and then you have a peak which should go up to here. And then it goes down to zero and then it continues. Or eventually, actually, depending on how you measure, it jumps there. Okay. Uh, but well, what we observe is this. So we have been working with this for a long time. And uh, why do you get, how do you get from here to here? It's because of uh, thermal fluctuations. So uh, actually, this is a this is a quantum effect, of course. And the way to understand this is uh, that you have to write down uh, this equation here. So this equation, this is the first Josephson equation. The current is proportional to the sign of the phase. Then there is the second Josephson equation is that the, uh, that the, that the current is proportional to the derivative, uh, that, that the voltage is proportional to the uh, derivative of the, of the current with respect to time, of the, of the phase with respect to time. Mm -hmm. So essentially you have three current uh, uh, paths, which are separated uh, at this point here, and we join again at this point here. One goes through a Josephson junction, a pure Josephson junction. So it provides you a sine phi. Another one goes to a resistor. So it, uh, uh, to a resistor. So it provides you with this component here. And uh, here, actually, you have the resistance. Mm -hmm. So this is a, a voltage multiplied by a resistance. Mm -hmm. So this is tau divided by tau j. So you got this up. Mm -hmm. A voltage divided by a resistance of a current. Mm -hmm. And here you have something related to the capacitance. So you have a Josephson junction, pure Josephson junction, a pure resistor, and the capacitance. Now, of course, we do not put any resistor in parallel of our measurements. 
But the point which is important here is that the whole thing is acting at very high frequencies. And at very high frequencies, there is a finite conduction between the tip and the samples because of the vacuum. So the electromagnetic waves go through the vacuum and there is a shunting resistance, which is the resistance of the vacuum, which is 300 ohm or something like that. So this is actually the way to understand these kinds of things. And uh, you can transform, you can change this equation and you can actually see that this equation is similar to if you pay, take a particle inside one, such, a, such of a potential. So uh, when you are at zero voltage here, mm -hmm. you have your particle is fixed here. There is a, the phase does not change with time. Mm -hmm. And therefore there is also a current which flows, which is a Coupe pair current and which should be as high as here. It is not because actually this phase is fluctuating. When you put the temperature, this phase is strongly fluctuating and therefore you get a mixture and uh, you get a strong reduction of the current. Now, when you increase the, the, the when you change, uh, for example, you put a finite voltage. Now, what happens is that uh, this, this potential changes and the phase can eventually run away. And at some point you can, you can describe this. So there is an intermediate situation where you have an AC current, which works at very high frequency. So this is uh, gigahertz more or less. <clears throat> now we took a look on this situation and we found an oscillation, which oscillation now is, however, in the millisecond range which is six orders of magnitude below the frequency uh, which, uh, which is taking, taking, which is happening in here. And the, the way to understand this is that actually there is a feedback mechanism. There is a feedback which acts on the Josephson junction and which removes this uh, tilt and which brings you to, again, to a phase coherent situation in spite of the noise. So this is a very nice equation, actually. So it's a nonlinear equation. And in addition, there is a feedback there. So you may get into a chaos and things like that very easily, actually. And fortunately enough, there is one regime which uh, is actually a switching regime between these two situations, and you can follow it nicely using, using a theory. And uh, you have a stable situation, which is the usual Josephson current, a bistable situation, and then a periodic oscillation, which is the usual AC Josephson. And this explains actually very nicely what we see in the experiment. So uh, you may say, okay, this is a nice effect, why not? But uh, the point is that if you take a look on this value here, the value, the time average value of the current, it only depends on this. This is the coupling parameter of the feedback and the shunt resistance. So it does no longer depend on the noise. So uh, this measurement here is actually uh, much closer to what we want to observe, which is the critical current or the current through the, through the junction. And we believe that this is an advance. You can use it as a function. You can trace this as a function of the position and you get an improvement with respect to previous uh, situations. So that it's, it's quite of promising because then we can, we can access the Cooper pair, the Cooper pairs. And, uh, and uh, so this is more or less uh, what, what I wanted to tell you on this, on this part. And, uh, and I think, let me, let me show you the, uh, uh, oops, let me show you the, oops, this is, yeah. Thank, me, thank you very much for your attention and probably we can have some discussion. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very much, Herman. So time for questions. Sebastian. I have a question. Well, and in the last part, which, uh, which material? Was it heavy fermion, no? No, 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 that would be great. Yeah, <laughs> that's the next step indeed. So we have done this between lead, lead, A lead, okay. lead, niobium, diselenite. Yeah. That's where you get this uh, this nice uh, a, a spatial resolution where you have this atomic lattice, and then also Sorry, aluminum. And, lattice. and then the, the question is, if you want to see Cooper pairs, why don't you go to the to the the high transmissive, uh, so that you see the Mars and all that. That's that's great. Yes. No. 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 That's of course. But then you cannot change the position. Okay, we want to see Cooper pairs, but we want to map. Okay, because you say you, you want to see map Cooper pairs, but the Cooper pairs, what you mean? You will measure this, the Josephson effect. This is to see the Cooper pairs for you. Yes. Okay. Okay, but if you have, I mean, you can change, if you have an oscillating order parameter, you are going to see that because you are going to yeah. see oscillation. You are not going to see the phase change. This would be okay. nice to, to, to grasp, but uh, you are going to see oscillations here. Which may not be easy to see in the in the gap structure, okay. or may not appear in the gap structure. Mm -hmm. So this is the main the main activity in the Josephson. This has been particularly through this pair density wave, where you expect that there is some oscillatory. So, for example, the FFL state it should pop up as an as a, as an oscillation because you have a, 
a change of the of the order parameter with respect to the or the helical state or the helical states or eventually states around the shiva and the shunt resistance is constant in all the measurement yeah this is something we cannot control so actually if you if you if you make this situation in a device like they may do i don't know in paris or wherever then then you can't control because you have a chip and then you put your sun resistance as you know in our device we can if you put something within between tip and sample we are going to shunt it and then we no longer scan so i, I mean the point is to make microscopy and uh, also in these materials if you want to do a quantum material uh, i mean a uh, if you go into the high transparency range, what are you tunneling into? So you have three options, okay? <laughs> and maybe you are even destroying the single crystal locally. So, so tunneling is a better, is definitely a yeah. better situation. Uh, Fernando? Thank you. I have a question about the 1D test case that appears to be Yeah. So, presumably, this boundary is in a set. Yeah. There are different ways to cut the steps. How do you know that the step here doesn't have an uranium and the step here doesn't have an silicon or something else? Well, yeah, that's it's true that it is pretty tough to be sure of that. Yeah. Mm. We, we, we are not completely sure of that. Mm. So what we have seen is that we suspect that the both endings are similar in from from the from the from the spatial dependence. Mm. But of course, mm. Mm. It may happen that we miss something in between. Mm -hmm. When you said that the two uranium atoms are different in the hidden quantum state, yeah. what's the difference? If it's hidden, what, what has been measured that can tell this, this to us? This is a great question, right? So, okay. <laughs> so people speak a lot about multipolar effects. Okay, so they paint very faint, uh, very nice uh, pictures of an F wave. And then you can say that this F wave has some sort of symmetry in one uranium lattice and another one in the other. But uh, uh, what does it mean? I still don't understand that. And I think you you can I mean it's you cannot paint an F wave in such a in such a solid separately from the rest of the world, right? So it is something collective, and we have to understand it collectively. And what I think. And what we know is we know about the excitations of these things. Neutron scatterers have been making uh, neutron scattering. There is no magnetic order, of course, but you have some excitations. And uh, these excitations are for for symmetric and they have a dispersion relation. So this and the, the doubling of the of the Fermi of the yes of the Fermi surface is what we know about this state. But we cannot say, okay, because if you have a magnetic state, you can't say, okay, it's a spin, right? Which is located here, it's an antiferromagnet. You can think of, of an arrow, which you put there, and it's reasonable enough. The question is, what is this arrow? This is something where we know what I told you, but. Dario? Uh, in the case of this quantum wave, uh, there is this stronger invalidation of the master. There is something more than just a two deck with a, a larger mark, or do you see some effect of electron population that, they, that is different from copper or any other surface state? Well, the, the, the change of the of the lifetime with uh, the bias voltage uh, indicates that you have a heavy family mm -hmm. in addition to the to the edge states. Yes, yeah, it's not my question, it's a question by Miguel Casadilla. It's okay. In Zoom. <laughs> And he's asking Sorry, if the, the model that you are using for this proximitized 2D electron, if you assume that the 2D electron gas is in a normal state, there is no superconductivity. Yes, yes. It's in a normal state. This is an assumption. Okay. This is an assumption, yes. That's a good point. So, have you just added the quantum wave state in the presence of a magnetic field? That's a very good question, yeah. That's something to be made. We did not. Uh, have we do have the magnetic field, of course. Yeah, 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 yeah. So what we focused on is to try to understand the whole thing. So, uh, as and uh, uh, well, you may see that if you take a look on the curves, uh, there there are curves and the magnetic field and the four Tesla. Uh, uh, oh, I don't have them here. Well, anyhow, you see, you see that the superconducting superconducting gap disappears as usual, but uh, we did not take a look on that closely now. So that's something to be made. 
I mean, it takes a lot of time. You know. So this material is non centrosymmetric. Well, it's centrosymmetric. No, no, it is centrosymmetric. And it's for falling the surface. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then yeah, yeah. Actually, structurally, there is nothing that explains yeah. that, I believe. Yeah. Unless that it's a reconstruction that froze, and then you should see in some regions perhaps one orientation, and some other regions another orientation, yeah. which you don't. No. We always observe the uranium. I mean, we can observe the uranium, the ruthenium, and the silicon lattice. The ones which are easiest to observe is the uranium lattice and the silicon lattice. We have mostly spent time on the uranium lattice, which we thought was more interesting, of course. And uh, we never see anything which could tell us that there is a, there is a, a symmetry broken there. Mm -hmm. Is it possible to go below that temperature there? Oh, a little bit, 200 millikeia. Actually, what limits our temperature is the energy resolution, right? So, I mean, you can go down to 20 millikeia if you want, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I think that this, this is limiting. What is limiting is oops, this, this, I mean, you, 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 have to, you have to trace some sharp structure and see how, what is the width, and this tells you where you end. You should be. More questions? Please. Yeah, could it be that it's uh, you don't have enough resolution in the STM to see the structural tiny charge density wave that might appear, or this is completely excluded? Well, I mean, you know, with an STM, we do have a, a well, we just, you can make the Fourier transform and you see the drag peaks. Now, with X ray, you see the, you see the Fourier transform of 10 to the 23 atoms. So uh, it's, you have a resolution which is far better than the STM. Now, people have been taking a look with X-rays to this problem, of course, and that sometimes they see a little change of 10 to the minus 5 in the, in the lattice constant difference between A and B, but it's pretty, probably due to impurities. That's the present situation. Most of the work has been made with an MR. An MR, you take the nuclei and you test the, 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 the field, the, the fine field action on the nuclei, and then you can uh, actually uh, um, see symmetries. And uh, with an MR, uh, it has been quite, it's for certain that the symmetry of the hidden wall state is awful. Mm -hmm. So mm, this is the situation now. Well, uh, samples are very good. I think maybe someone gets better samples, but uh, the purity is similar to, uh, to the purity of, I don't know, gold or something. Maybe not as much, but, uh, but uh, quite close to it. Thank you, Herman. That was great. Great talk. Thank you very much. <laughs>